Welcome to the uh, continuous integration, continuous delivery on AWS Talk here at the Global Partner Summit. Uh, I'm Leo Jadnowski. I'm a principal solutions architect here at AWS. Uh, and I'm going to be talking to you today about how to do CI and CD on AWS. And I'm specifically going to be giving you a live demo of some of our new tools, so code pipeline, code deploy. And so let's get started. So first of all, why does DevOps matter? Why is it important for you? Well, according to the Puppet Labs 2015 State of DevOps report, high-performing IT organizations deploy 30 times more frequently with 200 times shorter lead times, and they have 60 times fewer failures and recover 168 times faster. Lean management and continuous delivery practices create the conditions for delivering value faster and more sustainably for your customers. And you can achieve this high performance whether your applications are greenfield, brownfield, or legacy. And I'm going to talk about some of the tools that enable you to do that. AWS has a lot of offerings that you can take advantage of in this field. In, for DevOps. So I'm going to be talking about AWS Code Commit, which is our, uh, or actually, I'll briefly skim through AWS Code Commit, which is our Git hosting service. I'm going to be demoing AWS Code Pipeline, which is our continuous delivery service. And I'm going to be also demoing AWS Code Deploy, our deployment service. We also have a service called AWS CloudFormation, uh, which allows you to quickly and repeatedly spin up full environments, which include things like EC2 instances and ELBs and RDS and really almost any type of AWS artifact or service. Uh, we also have a service called AWS OpsWorks, uh, which I'm not going to be talking about today, but what it does is it's basically a managed chef service. It allows you to break up your application into layers so you can have your load balancer layer and your web layer and your app layer and your database layer, whatever you define those layers to be. And you can deploy things to those layers based on uh, chef recipes. So either pre-built chef recipes that you get off the internet or chef recipes that you write yourself. We also have something called Elastic Beanstalk. So Elastic Beanstalk allows you to just take your code, whether that code is uh, PHP or Python or Ruby or .NET or Node.js or Go, uh, or a Docker container. I'm sure I'm missing some container that it uh, supports as well. Uh, and you can send that code to the service. It deploys it. Uh, it sets up your uh, EC2 instances, your ELBs, your RDS instances for you. Uh, so you don't really have to worry about setting up the infrastructure. We also have a lot of marketplace offerings from our partners. Uh, so names like GitHub, Puppet Labs, SaltStack, Ansible, Chef. Uh, you can use all of these partner offerings with our services as well. There's a lot of opportunities for partners to integrate with our services. Our, our customers are implementing uh, DevOps rapidly, uh, and including tools for continuous integration and continuous delivery. I meet with customers all the time, and I can't count the number of times I get asked for help, whether uh, it's how do we implement CI, CD, how do we get our organization to do DevOps? So whether they're looking for software or looking for implementation help, it's really, really common. It's, it's a high need with our customers. AWS Code Deploy and Code Pipeline both are both very extensible. They integrate with a lot of third-party tools. And I'll be showing some of those tools off today. Uh, but our service teams are also looking for adding additional integrations as well. So if you're interested in integrating your tool with our services, uh, email code-request at amazon.com, and that will contact our service teams, and you can start the conversation with them then. So what is continuous integration? What is continuous delivery? Continuous integration is the practice in software engineering of merging all working copies, all developer working copies, to a shared mainline branch every time you commit to your uh, repo. So if you're a developer and you're working on code off your source control system and you commit that code, you're going to go through a continuous integration server. That continuous integration server is going to run some tests. And it's eventually, assuming everything passes, going to uh, integrate that code into the mainline branch. And continuous delivery is a, a software engineering approach which allows teams to keep producing valuable software in short cycles and ensure that the software can be 
reliably released at any given time. So basically, after your software has gone through continuous integration, you can then set it up so that it automatically deploys. So that every time you commit code, you get a deployment, whether it's a staging, into production, depending on how you set it up. So the advantage of this is you've now broken up your deploys into something much smaller and much less risky. So let's just review for a second about continuous uh, integration. So again, you're working on your code. That code gets automatically deployed to the mainline branch, but only after passing tests. And you, so you have to make sure that you write good tests. Uh, so there's this thing called test-driven development. So that's when you write your tests before you write your code. So you write a test, it's gonna, pa it's gonna fail because you don't have code for it yet, and then you write the code to pass the test. So that's a good practice to follow. So ultimately, this makes changes to your code iterative, not monolithic. So I have, I have customers who've gone from deploying four times a year to deploying multiple times a day. And that makes it easy to pick up bugs. The bugs are much smaller because there's much less things that have changed. Uh, it also forces you to automate your deployments. So if you're deploying four times a year, you know, if, you every, you know, if four times a year you have to uh, do a bunch of manual stuff, that might be okay. If you're deploying multiple times a day, that's not gonna scale. So it, this is gonna force you to automate everything, which is good. So that removes room for manual error. Uh, and it, it will uh, m make you release better, higher quality software and rapidly as well. So what does this look like from a developer perspective? Well, you're a developer, you're working with the source code repository, so this could be Git, which is what we're using in this uh, talk here. Uh, you also have a continuous integration server, so in this demo we're gonna be using Jenkins, uh, there's a lot of other offerings out there, Cloud B is, Travis CI, Circle CI, a lot of other things that you could use for that. And then you have your project management server. So your project management server is just where you're keeping track of your tasks as a developer. So what, what you're working on. This could be something like Jira, it could be a, a, a lot of software. And so you get assigned a task, you pick that task, you work on that task, you write the code. Once you've written the code, you commit the code to your, soft, uh, your source control repository. Once the code is committed, this will kick off your continuous integration server, so it'll automatically schedule a build. Usually this is done through something like a post receive hook or through your continuous integration uh, server pulling your uh, change management system or your source code repository. And you can also set up recurring builds. So recurring builds are, you know, you can set up so that every midnight it does a build, it does a bunch of load tests on it, you know, something like that, so regardless of whether you made changes or not, you're, you keep testing if your code works, if your deployment works. So it fetches the code because you've hooked up either a post receive hook or you've, uh, um, you're pulling your source code repository. It knows exactly what commit to pull, so it pulls your latest code. It runs tests against that code. Assuming those tests pass, uh, it will then go on to deployment. Now, if the tests fail, you should get notifications. So you should configure, you know, whether it's email or uh, you know, text message or whatever you want to do, so configure some kind of notification so that your developer knows their build has failed, their test failed. Assuming it passes, you have build output, right? So that build output can be something like documentation that's automatically generated. It can be binaries and packages. Uh, it can be notifications, so whether, again, the build is successful or not. Uh, now, something I've seen recently among our customers is immutable infrastructure. So instead of just using the same set of instances to deploy on all the time, instead you, what you're building is Amazon machine images or Docker containers, or your Amazon machine images and Docker containers, and also CloudFormation templates. So you're treating your infrastructure as code, you're spinning up a whole new CloudFormation stack every single time you have a major deployment, and so you're, what that means, the reason it's immutable is what you've already deployed never gets touched. It's deployed, you never log into it ideally, it's just there, and then you put up something new at the next deployment, and there's a lot of benefits to this. So you can roll back really easily because you don't have to actually roll back your code, you just redirect back to your old infrastructure. Uh, it's also from a security perspective, it's really good. So uh, if you can disable login, that's a good thing. Also, if you're replacing all your infrastructure all the time, that means if something does get compromised, it's not gonna be compromised for long because it's not gonna live for long. So there's a lot of advantages to doing that, but you also have to set up the proper tooling to make sure that it works. So what does this usually look like traditionally on AWS? Well, so you're using 
probably an uh, EC2 instance for your Git repository or whatever version control system you use. You're using another EC2 instance for your continuous integration server. You're using an EC2 instance to host your project management software. And you're publishing the builds to S3. So you have an S3 bucket, and that's where you're deploying off of. However, what if you didn't want to manage a lot of that stuff? Well, we, in the past year, have released uh, several new services. So we have this group of three code services, AWS Code Commit, AWS Code Pipeline, and AWS Code Deploy. So let's walk through them. First of all, we've, the services we previously had, they were oriented towards deploying your code, provisioning your code, monitoring your code. So I already described what Elastic Beanstalk and OpsWorks do, and CloudFormation, and then CloudWatch is our metrics service, so it gives you metrics on you know, what's my CPU usage, what's my network out of my instances. You can have custom metrics. There's also a component of the service called CloudWatch Logs, where you run an agent on your instance and it sends logs to it, and so that's for monitoring. But what about storing your code? Well, so code commit is our Git service. It is private Git repositories hosted on Amazon S3. It is fully Git compatible, so if you're used to using Git, this is the same exact experience. It has all the benefits of an AWS cloud service, so it's built for scale, it's built to be durable, reliable, and it's low pay-as-you-go pricing. Another important thing is there's no, si there's no size limits on the repositories. So because it's hosted on S3, you can have giant repositories, you can store really big files. And there's an online web console. Uh, so as of yesterday, we, before you could um, remove or add repositories to the web console. Uh, but now, as of yesterday, you can also browse your code through the web console as well. And also, it has integration with IAM. So if you're already using IAM roles or IAM users, you can integrate this with access, granular access to your uh, Git repositories. So again, it's the same exact Git experience that you're used to. So if you look at what I'm doing here, it's I'm cloning a repository, just the endpoint I'm cloning it from happens to be the code commit endpoint. I'm editing a readme file, I'm up doing a commit, and I'm pushing back to the, uh, to the repository. That's it. It's exactly the same experience as using Git. Then we have code pipeline. So uh, code pipeline is our continuous delivery service. It allows you to model and visualize your workflow so you can say, I want to take this code from source control to deployment to load testing to Jenkins uh, you know, uh, functional and unit testing to a production deploy. It integrates with third-party tools. It has custom actions. So if there's something it doesn't support right now, you can do a custom action through a worker process uh, to kick it off. And so it allows you to automate this whole process. And uh, I'll show you how this actually works uh, in a few minutes. Lastly, we have AWS Code Deploy. So Code Deploy works by running an agent on your instance. It also works off of EC2 and AWS, so you can run the agent on-premise as well. Uh, it allows you to do rolling updates. So you deploy, and you can decide, I want to deploy to every single instance that I have. I want to deploy to half of them, some of them, so on and so forth. Uh, it works with, it's got built-in health checks, so you can say, well, okay, I've done the deployment. Is my application that I've just updated healthy now? If yes, mark this deployment as successful. If no, mark it as failed and stop the deployment. It's got integration with auto-scaling. So when you're deploying to an auto-scaling group, your auto-scaling group could be two instances, it could be 100 instances, you don't really know. And typically, that's a challenge to deploy to. But with code deploy, you can target a whole auto-scaling group and just say deploy to everything in this auto-scaling group. It works with any application, so I'll show you the way it works, but basically uh, there's different lifecycle stages and you kick off, you run executables during the lifecycle stages. So you can really get it to run any kind of command. Uh, you can also use it to completely do your deploy from a base AMI to a fully deployed uh, instance, or you can say if you're using Chef or Puppet or uh, some kind of scripting already, you can just get it to kick off that scripting and that's it. So it's very, very flexible. So now we've got services for a full cloud software development lifecycle from storing your code to building and testing your code to deploying your code, provisioning it, and monitoring it using our tools. So now let's take a look at this architecture. So I, I, pretend I don't have to use EC2 instances to manage my own Git anymore, and I'm doing continuous delivery through code pipeline as well. 
So this has simplified my deployment process here. Oops, sorry, I want to hit by one slide here. So the other thing I wanted to let you know about was we now have a uh, AWS Partner Competency Program for DevOps solutions. So it's broken up into two different kinds of solutions. Uh, we've got uh, partners that deal with configuration management. So Chef, Puppet, SaltStack, Ansible, HashiCorp, those are all vetted with this program. And we've got another set of partners that are doing continuous integration and delivery. So partners such as CloudBees, uh, CodeShip, GitHub, BlazeMeter, Travis CI, and I'll be showing you BlazeMeter in this demo here. So here's today's demo, and before I go to this, let me actually kick my demo off here so it'll be running while I'm talking about it. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm just gonna unlock my laptop here. All right, so what I've got here is uh, I've got my laptop, I've got a shell window into my, uh, my checkout of a Git repo. So let me just, uh, to kick off my build process with Code Pipeline, I'm just gonna make a change to my Git repo. And my Git repo is just a WordPress install, so no nothing really fancy here. So what I'm gonna do is edit my readme file. I'm going to add some exclamation marks. Really big change here. I'm going to commit it. All right. And I'm going to push it out to GitHub and code commit. And so that's going to kick off my build. So while that's going, uh, let's talk about how my demo is actually set up here. All right, so in today's demo, uh, we're gonna be using a combination of our tools as well as uh, partner tools. So I'm storing my code in GitHub. Uh, I'm also storing a backup copy of it in code commit. Uh, I'm building the code. It's PHP, so I don't really have to build it, but I'm, I'm basically um, running a test on the code using Jenkins. Um, and Code Pipeline is orchestrating all of this. After I test the code, uh, I'm gonna do a deployment through code deploy to an auto-scaling group, which is my staging environment. So it's an auto-scaling group within uh, two instances, I believe, and it's behind an ELB. Uh, I'm then, after that staging deploy is done, I'm doing a load test. So I'm load testing using BlazeMeter, which is a hosted load testing product, which has integration with code pipeline. Uh, I'm kicking off that load test, after the load test completes, uh, I'm then deploying again to production, which is another auto-scaling group. And then I'm also using CloudWatch to monitor my auto-scaling group, and I'm also using New Relic as well. So I've got the New Relic agent installed as part of my code deploy, and I'm marking the deployment. So every time I do a deployment, it gets marked by code deploy uh, to, in New Relic. So we can see when we did a deployment. So let's look at the architecture that I have for my WordPress. Uh, I have an ELB that's serving my traffic. Uh, the ELB is attached to an auto-scaling group across two availability zones of uh, WordPress. I have a Jenkins instance that's just running off to the side. It's not serving any production traffic. So if I wanted to make this HA, uh, I would probably just turn on EC2 auto recovery on my Jenkins instance. And I have, for my database tier, I'm using a multi-AZ RDS instance with my SQL. Uh, now, I don't have it on the diagram, but I wanted to make my WordPress really, really uh, scalable, so I also have the WP Cache plugin installed, and it's offloading my static assets to S3. My S3 bucket is backed by CloudFront, so I've got a CDN. And I'm also using Elastic Cache with Memcached, so I'm, I'm doing caching as well with Memcached. So that's my setup. This is how I'm deploying. So what happens is I'm working on the code. I push the code to GitHub. It gets pushed for DR to code commit as well, but I'm primarily working off of GitHub for this. What happens is GitHub is being pulled by code pipeline. So I've connected code pipeline to GitHub, and 
whenever there's a new commit, code pipeline starts a new pi uh, release. So it knows that there's new software that it needs to release. So code pipeline pulls in the new commit into a zip file. That zip file gets moved to S3. Jenkins then pulls code pipeline for any new activity. So I've, I've installed, we have a code pipeline plugin for Jenkins. It's connected to my, that specific pipeline, and it runs every minute, and it's gonna pull for changes in the code. As soon as there's new activity, Jenkins runs the test I've configured it to run on my PHP code. So this could be like PHP unit testing, although I'm doing something a lot more simple. And it notifies code pipeline of the results of my test. So if my test fails, it stops right there. If my test passes, we then go on to deployment. So we're going to code deploy now. So what happens with code deploy is my instances are notified of the deployment by the code, so they've got the code deploy agent running on them, it's talking to their code deploy service, and they're notified that there's a deployment. They download and install the zip file. So what happens is code pipeline pulls that zip file from uh, GitHub, it packages it up into S3, Jenkins, as a part of its test, pulls that zip file, runs the test, repackages the zip file. So I could just have it use my original zip file, but I, if I wanna you know, do something with my test results, if I wanna create some graphs, I, I can also use that as an output as well. Um, after this is downloaded, code deploy does the deployment. It is notified, the service is notified by the instances whether the individual deploy on that instance has been successful or not. And depending on my deployment scheme, whether it's one at a time, half at a time, uh, I can set how many, what percentage or what number of my instances I want to be healthy, it's marked as successful or failed. And lastly, uh, so then we run the load test on, uh, on Blaze Meter. So the load test is run on my staging auto scaling group. And if that passes, and in that I've set a threshold for what I want my average response time to be and what my error rate to be. And so if that passes, we trigger another deploy to production, to my production auto scaling group. And then if that passes, we can actually, both for staging and production, we can see that this deployment is marked in New Relic. So if I go to New Relic, I can see I did this deployment on this instance, and if you have, you know, I do think it's the pro plan of in New Relic, you can then see, hey, did this deploy, uh, you know, break something? Is my page faster or slower? So you can compare before and after with your deploy. So I have really good visibility into whether my deploy was successful or not. So let's talk a little bit about code deploy lifecycle events, so how the actual code deploy happens. So the first thing that happens when uh, code deploy is notified of a new deployment is my instance itself is notified of the new deployment. And again, how many instances are notified depends on the deployment schedule that I configure. So if I have all at a time, every single instance starts deploying at the same time. If I have one at a time, it does one at a time, and you can do custom uh, schedules as well. So then we go to the application stop lifecycle stage. The application stop lifecycle stage, what that does is it stops uh, well, first of all, it deregisters my instance from the load balancer. And that's important because if I just stopped my Nginx, uh, we would then be relying on my ELB's health check to determine whether it's healthy or not. And if it determines whether it's unhealthy, and say I have a threshold of 10 checks to mark it as healthy again, that could take it out of service for a while. Or if it, uh, you know, it could return a few errors to my users before getting marked as unhealthy. So I'm just manually deregister, de or not manually, but I, I have a script where I'm deregistering it from the ELB, and then I stop Nginx. Then I download the bundle, so I'm downloading the zip file with my code that I'm actually deploying. And then there's a step called before install. So before install, I have it configured to delete all my old code, so it's starting fresh with every deploy. It installs any dependencies that I need, so uh, I'm running on Amazon Linux, so I'm just doing a yum install with you know, whatever packages I need here, and if they're already installed, it'll just say, hey, it's already installed, I don't have to do this all over again. And I'm installing the new Relic agents. So I'm installing the agent, and the agent has some logic in it uh, that I've configured through a shell script to, that it knows whether it's a production or a staging environment, and what my license key is, and all that kind of stuff. Then it actually installs my, my PHP code for WordPress, and then we have an after install lifecycle step. So after install, it updates my permissions. So I do my chmod and my chown to what PHP should be for uh, WordPress. I'm downloading credentials. So this is really important. You do not want to store your credentials to things like your RDS instance in your GitHub repository, right? I've had a lot of instances with my customers where 
they do this and they're doing it in a private repo, but then somebody forks the repo, somehow it becomes public, and then before you know it, somebody's launching you know, Bitcoin farms on your AWS account or deleting stuff, you don't want that. So do not put any creds into your, uh, into your Git. So a good practice to, have, to avoid this is you have a S3 bucket. It's a private S3 bucket. You put your creds in there. You can use servers or encryption if you want with that bucket. And your instances in your auto scaling group, you give them an IAM role. That IAM role uh, gives the instances access to the S3 bucket without having to have any permanent creds hard coded into your code. They download as part of your deploy. You copy those creds in and you're all set. So it's way more secure. Uh, if you need to yank, change that IAM role, change the policy associated, well, you can do that live. So it's really nice. So then I mark the deployment in URLic, so we know we've deployed the code at this point in our monitoring system. And then I start my web server backup. So I start Nginx backup, and after it started backup, I re-register with the ELB. And by register, deregister with the ELB, uh, what I'm actually doing is I'm using ELB's lifecycle stages, so I'm actually putting it in standby. I'm not fully deregistering it, because that's faster to, to put it in standby. And lastly, we have the validate service uh, stage. So validate service, I just have a little shell script which curls the local web server to make sure we're returning to 100, to make, make sure we're healthy. Let's talk about code deploy, uh, default deployment configs. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you can do it all at once. If you're deploying to staging or testing, you don't really care about it going down for a second. Uh, you can deploy to everything at once if you just want to do it quickly. You can do half at a time. So, Again, this just deploys to one half of your instances in your, in your deployment group. Then after it's successful, it deploys to the other half. And if it's not successful, it stops and you still have half your instances that are healthy. If you want to be really conservative, you can deploy one at a time. So if any of these fails, it'll just stop the deployment. So if you want to be really safe, you can do that. Additionally, we have custom deployment configs. So you can do this based on host count. So you can say, I would like no less than the X number of hosts, so let's say 10, that should be healthy during my deployment. And so regardless of the number of total instances I have, and so if, 10 are ever, if it's ever less than 10 unhealthy, it'll stop the deployment. You can also do fleet percentage. So you can say, I would like 80% of my hosts, or whatever percent you want, to be healthy during deployment. So you can get pretty flexible here. What happens with failed deployments? So let's say we're deploying to a bunch of instances. Say here we're doing one at a time. So I've deployed to my first instance and it's okay. It goes on to the second instance. I deploy to my second instance, it's okay. It deploys to the third instance. The third instance fails and it stops. So what's important is we don't automatically roll back for you. We don't wanna assume that you wanna roll back automatically. So at this point, you've got two instances with your new code, one instance with your old code, and so you would, at this point, figure out why this deployment fails. So let's say you want to just roll back to the last version. You just initiate another deployment with the old version, and it'll do this process all over again. So we think it's more flexible for you this way. So let's switch over to my live demo and see what, what's been going on here. Okay. So let me show you what I have. So again, I've got my Git repo. I've got my EC2 instances, so I've got three instances in my staging auto scaling group here. I've got six instances in my production auto scaling group here. I've got RDS, or sorry, I've got, I've got RDS as well, but that's not what I'm showing. I've got WordPress, and I've got my code deploy deployment group. So I've got a staging deployment group and a production deployment group, and these are tied to uh, my auto scale group. So as you can see here, this is my production group. I've decided to do half at a time deployment, um, and I'm targeting this demo WordPress auto scaling group here. And then I've got my staging group, and that's tied to my staging. I've also got uh, GitHub. So here's my code pipeline. So this is my actual pipeline. So the first stage is it's looking at my GitHub repository, which is here. Then we're going to Jenkins. We're running tests in Jenkins. Then we're doing this deployment uh, for my staging auto scaling group. And then we're doing a load test, which just succeeded. 
And now we're just doing the production deploy. So this has been happening since I first kicked off that I committed, I did that commit before my slides. So let's walk through what else I have here. Uh, since it's doing the deploy, let's see what's going on here. So we're gonna look at my deployments. And so see there's a deployment going on right now that's in process. So this one from eight minutes ago, that was my staging deployment. And this is my production deployment. So let's see what's happening here. So it says deployment in progress. So we can see this is the S3 bucket with my artifacts from my GitHub repo. And see it's doing three at a time. So right now it's on the first three instances. And it's gonna wait to make sure these succeed before going on to the second three instances. And so we, you can see what event it's currently on. So it's currently on after install on two of them and application start another one. And if I, I could actually click on view events here, I can see specifically what's going on. So this one just finished. So we can see it went through each of these lifecycle stages and uh, we can see how long they took. And if they failed, you could see why they failed, but it succeeded. So let's go back here. So now we've got three succeeded and now it's going on to the next three. So let's take a look at how code deploy is, con uh, is configured. Here's my GitHub repo. Again, this is just your standard WordPress. And code deploy is controlled by a app spec file. So let me just make this a little bit bigger so you can see. Uh, and so this is the app spec file. So the first part of this app spec file is my file section. And this just tells it what to copy where. So I'm taking files from the same Git repo and I'm copying them into their destinations. Then I have a permission section. So my permission section just says, after you've copied these files, change the permissions to the username and the, the owner and the group and the, the file mode to what I've specified here. And then we've got these lifecycle hooks. So again, I have a before install section and I'm installing uh, my dependencies. So these are all just very simple shell scripts that I've written. Um, I'm installing New Relic, I'm removing all files, all the stuff I told you about. So, it, and you can have it run PHP files, uh, which is what I'm doing with my uh, New Relic deployment marking. I have a script for that. You can have it run any executable file, really. And it runs as root by default, too. So, I've got, this is where uh, the actual config files that it copies are for Nginx and for PHP. And these are, again, my scripts. So these are just, again, very, very simple shell scripts, like I'm literally just CH modding here, um, I'm yum installing stuff, so this doesn't have to be very complicated if, if you don't want it to be. So then let's look at my blaze meter. So these are my load tests here. So every time I do a deploy, I'm doing a load test on my staging environment. So here's the load test I did 10 minutes ago. And we can see I had 50 users I was testing against, and you can see over the course of this load test, exactly how it did here, if I had any errors, what the response time was. And you can see my thresholds. So uh, I want it to be less than two seconds of res average response time, and I want less than 5% error rate. So I got zero error rate, and I had uh, about a 137 uh, millisecond response time. And then I've got Jenkins. So let's take a look at how I have Jenkins configured. So I've got a project, oh, it looks like I have to log in again, let me do that, there we go. So this is my project, and uh, I've got our code pipeline plugin configured for it. So all I'm doing here is I'm using, I'm not even connected directly to Git here. I, I'm using our code pipeline plugin, and I just have it set so that uh, it uh, knows it's doing a test, it knows the provider is Jenkins, and this, is li this lines up with what I have configured here. And then I'm having it pull uh, code pipeline once a minute, so once every minute, but you can change that schedule. And this is the actual test that I'm doing, so it's not a very good test. I'm just echoing out testing rocks, so hopefully you're doing better tests than this uh, when you're building your applications. And really, that's all I have going here. So we can see what's going on here is it's pulling the code pipeline service, and the last time it did this was when I kicked off this build, and so, what I did here was, it, again, it downloaded the zip file from S3, it extracted it into my workspace, it ran my test, my test succeeded, it rezipped it and put it back up and let code pipeline know that it succeeded. So this is, again, very simple. Uh, and my workspace, again, is just a checkout of my Git repository here. This is my actual blog. 
This is by cool WordPress. You can see I put an image on there that will make nerds very angry. Um, and this is my new relic. So here we can see when it did the, the staging deployments here. And here we can see where it did the production deployments. And we can see how much different types of calls did. So I can see if my memcache is taking time or my PHP is taking time. Um, you can see different deployments here. You can see which transactions take the longest. So this makes sense. I have a, uh, WordPress has a cron job that runs every once in a while and it has to do scheduled action, so that, that takes a while. But my index is pretty fast. And then I can see my instances here. And so what I've got here is um, I've got the New Relic application agent installed and I've got the New Relic server agent installed as well. So it's running inside my PHP uh, FPM and it's running a separate agent just for monitoring the software so, or the server. So if I click on any one of these instances, I can see a lot of information about the instance. So I can see what my kernel is, I can see all the load history, CPU usage, which actual processes are running, what's taking up the most, uh, uh, what's taking up the most uh, RAM, uh, you know, which applications I have running on here. So you get a lot of really useful information. And the last thing I want to show you with New Relic was, again, just the deployment marking. So let's go to deployments here. So again, we can see all of my deployments, and these are each of these in individual deployment on an instance. And you can see, well, did this cause you know, any errors? And so I can click on the specific deployment, and it'll actually change, it'll tell me, you know, during this deployment, here's if anything changed, if anything broke, if there's any errors. So it's, it's super useful. And so with this, I, I've, through not a lot of complexity, configured it so if I'm a developer, all I did here to kick off this whole process was I changed my code. I made a commit to my Git repo, and this kicked off this whole process. So if I'm a developer, I don't really have to worry about setting any of this up once it's set up. It just automatically happens. So there's a lot of value to that. Uh, it, it reduces complexity and allows you to automate the, your whole continuous integration and continuous uh, deployment lifecycle. So that's what I uh, had for you in terms of a live demo. So Thank you for your time. Uh, so I'm gonna be taking questions over here. And one more thing before you get up is uh, just remember to complete your evaluations. So it's in your app for your, um, for your reInvent app. So there's an evaluation section there. So go ahead and fill those out. Uh, but thanks a lot. Um, I'll be over here taking questions.